Good morning, guys. This is your host, Hao Tran of the Vietnam Innovators podcast series. Uh, we're super happy to be welcoming our newest guest on the show here today. His name is Kelly Wong. He's the VP of operations at VNG, one of the biggest private companies in all of Vietnam, uh, of any company, actually, really. So uh, we're going to be hearing from him here today about uh, what his contribution to the company is, you know, what the vision of VNG is, and and what the next 16 years looks like because the company has been here for almost two decades. So, anyways, welcome to Vietcetra's Radio Room Studio here today, Kelly. Thank you, Hal. It's a pleasure to be here today. Yes, and and a little background too, guys. Um, Kelly and I we go way back. Quite not a number. That, of not years. that we've known each other for that long, but I think four, three, four years now. And I remember the first time I met you, it was at a hotel lobby. Uh, you're working at, at Keto Group. I still believe at that time as CFO. And um, actually, that series we were doing to kind of capture your management style and your your vision for leadership. And you know, you've been at this pretty big company for for almost a decade. And then uh, just recently, I was uh, surprised in a good way to hear that you moved on to VNG. Obviously, it's even a bigger company and uh, different set of ambitions and goals. So I think today, as part of our Vietnam Innovator series, we want to hear about um, you know what your fresh take on this company is and why, why you've moved on to, to VNG. Um, but before we jump into that, um, We'd love to hear from you. Who are you? What are you doing here? You're not Vietnamese. You're Canadian, Chinese. Yes. Um, so give me the quick elevator pitch about sure. what you're doing here. So I was born in Hong Kong, but I moved to Canada when I was one. So I spent my whole life um, growing up, going to school, and just basically in Canada already. So mm -hmm. through and through Canadian. I moved to Vietnam probably uh, 16, 17 years ago, so in 2004 and have been journeying through Vietnam and watching its grow through different roles. So I started off here uh, with HSBC. I transitioned to Ho Chi Minh Securities, uh, spent quite a number of years at Keto as their group CFO, and now landed over at uh, VNG for the last year or so. Cool. And a little background for those that don't know, HSBC, obviously a, a big global bank. Correct. Keto Group, a little bit more localized. It's a Vietnamese FMCG brand. Uh, yes. And uh, making like, pastries and... Started off with confectionaries confectionary, and then right. moved into uh, different products like ice cream, edible oils gotcha. and different things like and, that. And now you've moved into a tech company. So three very different things. Uh, what, what would you describe as, as the underlying like what's tied it all together professionally for you? Is it your finance background? You're obviously operations now. Like sure. what, what brings you to, to each different kind of space? I think it started off with a very strong finance focus because HSBC was a financial services firm. Mm -hmm. And that's where I got most of my technical training. Um, but over the years, um, the conscious choice was to find a more local uh, enterprise to really learn about Vietnam mm -hmm. um, with the objective to really understand how this uh, this country works in terms of a business context and then really just to get to know how things are done and really try to uh, find my own way here mm -hmm. um, and using finance as sort of the the catalyst to move from job to job that's really helped me in terms of finding my own place mm -hmm. in you know uh, business in Vietnam yep. and moving into tech was a drastic change for me uh, still is a, a big adjustment in terms of learning mm -hmm. but I think what's really held it together was all those years of learning about how um, um, business and companies work in Vietnam, and then also understanding, um, you know, the ambitions of VNG and where they want to be, and then just trying to help um, structure and organize myself in and around supporting that growth and, and, and uh, ambition. Got it. And, you know, all these companies, um, they're obviously decades, if not centuries old, and VNG yeah. being one of the younger ones, I imagine. Yes. 16 years now, um, and you're coming in at a, at a more senior level and a large organization, um, from your kind of viewpoint, uh, what do the next 16 years at VNG look like? And um, obviously they, they went from like, I think games when they first started, they moved into, you know, last week they announced a new like artificial intelligence, uh, AI, like a, an Alexa, I forgot, I don't even, I can't recall the name, but Kiki, Kiki, yes. got it. Uh, so uh, Kiki, there you go. A little product placement right there. Um, what, what do the next 16 years look like for you, um, for VNG and, and what role do you play in that, that growth? I think looking forward, um, 16 years is a long time for a tech company. Um, you know, the industry in which we operate changes almost constantly. Um, from where we sit today, we feel that, you know, if we can set ourselves on the right path for the next three years, we're probably in pretty good shape. 
Um, if we look at what uh, the last 16 years have brought in us, I think we've grown significantly as an organization um, and a business, uh, if we want to differentiate the two things, alongside the development of Vietnam. Um, you know, with all the modernization, um, mobile technology and different things that have been happening, we've been well placed to really be part of that growth. If we look forward, um, let's say even three to five years, um, our long term ambition is to use technology to make lives better um, and also found a, find a way to use technology to empower Vietnamese people. If you look across all our different businesses today, which include uh, mobile games, uh, we have Zalo as a platform, as a communications platform, uh, and then we also have Zalo Pay, and then we also have our cloud business. A lot of that has been in the growth stage for the last few years. A um, big part of what we want to do is identify different ways in which we can, um, you know, make those technologies better, more meaningful, and also have a better positive impact on society as a whole in Vietnam. And that could be from like something coming out of Zalo where we're enabling small businesses to be able to communicate with their customers or the new AI technology that uh, makes our users and consumers lives easier through one way or another by, you know, speech recognition or optical character recognition or um, some sort of way to make um, some create some value for them. Um, or we can move all the way down to like Zalo Pay, where we're enabling uh, merchants and consumers to interact with each other and transact in a, in a non-cash way. Just that's where I think the next three to five years is, is looking at all those different verticals, really understanding, okay, what's our offering and our value proposition um, to society as a whole, uh, meaning users, merchants, or however we classify them, just people in general. And then really just driving our um, business forward and making a better product that actually creates a lot more value for these people. Um, you know, if we fast forward and try to answer your question 16 years, um, it's a tough one. I'm hoping that we create even more products and services um, through technology. Maybe we adopt it from overseas and maybe we try to invent some of our own or we adapt some of the different things that we come across to create even more verticals that have continued positive impact on Vietnamese people and society as a whole. And, you know, this sounds like a very, uh, I guess, broad question, but what is the offering? Because, sure. you know, you think of Amazon from a consumer yep. point of view, it's it's literally e-commerce. You can go online, buy something, gets delivered to you. Yep. They've expanded across a, a lot more profitable, higher margin businesses mm -hmm. like Amazon Cloud or Amazon Web Services. Um, they've obviously done some hardware creation. Sure. Uh, VNG started as a gaming company. What is, what is the cash cow? Sure. for VNG and, and what keeps the, the engine humming, but also what are what are those moonshot projects that you hope to be the future cash cow or the yeah. one that really gets the company, you know, getting the balance sheet stronger and stronger every, every yeah. day? I think our traditional business of gaming and now mobile games has mm -hmm. afforded us a lot of opportunity, um, you know, to create a, that it's created a very stable business for mm -hmm. us over a long period of time. And that's where we started off. Are those games global? Um, a lot of them coverage? are global, uh, developed by uh, our partners for global distribution. Mm -hmm. So we publish in Vietnam and also around Southeast Asia, Got certain it. markets. I, I asked this question just because I've never played a, I don't even have a game on my phone actually, oh, wow, so I okay. couldn't even tell you what games <laughs> um, you could possibly have, sure. but um, I'm, I'm just very curious. Okay. And, and yeah, you know, you're obviously moving into things like AI now. So this really, this mission of making society better, especially for Vietnamese, how, how does that spell for VNG's global ambitions? I remember in 2017, sure. I'm just reading this online. I've never actually asked anyone, but you know, they, the company explored a potential IPO listing in, on, in the US uh, NASDAQ stock exchange. Sure. No idea where that, you know, obviously ended up. Um, how does that fit into the whole equation for VNG? Sure. How global does it actually want to become? Or is it, is it really just doubling down on the Vietnam market? Um, I think technology as a uh, industry is very global. There's no real borders in mm -hmm. the sense that you can't stop information flowing from one country to another unless you know you a, an entire country consciously decides to do it. Mm -hmm. um, our business by nature uh, and all the verticals we're in are either domestic in the sense that we're only serving a domestic consumer mm -hmm. and things like cloud is a very domestic business. Mm -hmm. um, Zalo Pay from a regulatory perspective is very domestic. Um, but you know things like social and platform and also games are very international in its nature. 
Um, this year, or sorry, 2020, we spent a significant significant amount of time as a senior team to really define what going global means. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also looking at the environment that we're in today, mm-hmm. right? It is a very global environment with like very minimal travel. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean for us as a business and how do we move this forward? So from our perspective, we've taken a long and hard look at how we want to position ourselves in the different verticals of our business. Um, I think game in itself can be a very global business. It already by nature is a very global business. We've been a very strong Vietnamese publisher for games in Vietnam. Um, We've started branching off starting in 2017 and 18 into exploring um, Southeast Asia as a market. Um, in the last few years, we've also branched even further with some of our own developed games into other emerging markets as far as Latin America. And we've got plans to look at countries like Russia, India, and even further abroad than mm. that. Wow. So I think from a going global perspective, that's what we mean is how do we bring our business um, overseas through products and services? And some of it's developed by us, some of it's uh, developed by other people where we act as a publisher. Mm-hmm. So you guys, um, this whole going global narrative, and obviously there's people involved in that, investments to be made in-house, outside. Let's shift gears a little bit to um, not what VNG has done directly, but has participated in. So for example, I've been reading in the news recently, VNG has been making some venture investments. Uh, I believe that's part of the growth strategy. So big and small, you know, one of them was, I believe a company called EcoTruck and the the low millions of dollars. that company aside or, or, or others included, um, what does that investment strategy look like for you guys? Sure. Are you investing in more startups and how does that look? Do you, do you want to build your own little startups or do you want to invest in others? How does that ecosystem play sure. a part? Um, I think it comes down to where we sit in terms of resources, Mm -hmm. right? Um, If you look at where we are today, we're spending a significant amount of resources growing our own business and expanding our own business. If we look at, um, you know, what we can do in terms of working with um, startups in Vietnam or even looking at um, companies overseas, I think a big part of our uh, strength is that we have financial resources and experience. So when we approach the market from an investment perspective, that what we're really looking for are, um, number one, really good ideas. Um, Number two, uh, really, really good people that can execute those ideas. Mm -hmm. And number three, a market in which the idea and the people can really grow and flourish. Mm -hmm. What we're providing um, outside of financial capital is really um, experience, um, a different perspective, and hopefully some, you know, mentoring in the sense that, hey, we've gone down this path before. These are some of the things that you need to look at. And, you know, one of the things that we really, really focus on is, number one, we want to be able to help nurture a larger startup community through that, um, I would say, investment in uh, financial investment also, but um, the, you know, intellectual capital that we can bring from Mm -hmm. our experiences and also just some experience sharing. Mm -hmm. Um, And we feel like, you know, having achieved, um, you know, what we've achieved, we want to give back a little bit. Mm -hmm. And. You know, we want to help the next, um, you know, coming wave of entrepreneurs and startup owners to really uh, flourish and grow as well. That's great. You know, going to the whole um, building this ecosystem to allow tech to flourish in Vietnam, uh, we've got a great listener question sure. for you. Um, so for those of you that don't know, I post on my LinkedIn usually a couple days before every podcast session. And we got a great question from Anjum. He's uh, the partner at Vina Capital Ventures. Uh possibly with a partner of VNG already, I'm I'm not sure. But uh, Jum, he's been here obviously a long time, invested in media and tech. And his question, um, I'll uh, I'll have him play, uh, we'll we'll play the question now. By the way, it's not his voice, it's (laughs) someone from our team. We couldn't couldn't get the audio recording, but here's his question right here for you guys. Hi, my name is Jung, and I have a question today. So how, if at all, will tech startup play a role or get support from within the VNG ecosystem? The question there was, um, I mean, as he as he mentioned, well, what does that support look like? You know, a lot of the stuff you're saying is, is pretty broad. You know, sure. we didn't have time to elaborate, obviously, but maybe you can pinpoint something specific. Like, for example, the Amazon Web Services doles sure. out thousands of dollars of credits for startup companies, but even sure. bigger ones. Maybe you can pinpoint specific initiatives that VNG has done for. 
Um, for a lot of our investments, um, we really, you know, focus on their independent growth first and foremost. We want to make sure that as a standalone business and a standalone team, they're ready to execute and they're able to execute. I think the next thing we look at is um, the ability to integrate some of their products and services into our um, our own products and services. So a really good example is uh, a small small startup that we uh, invested in. And they do gifting. Um, so essentially, it's what your box? No, it's no, not. It's uh, not. <laughs> I'm not sure what else it could be. <laughs> anyway, so sure. Yeah. So it's um, it's a small gifting mm -hmm. uh, functionality that we have embedded into our Zalo, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, if there's a birthday that comes up, it says, "Hey, happy birthday." Uh -huh to so-and-so underneath there'll be a little line that says okay you can send a gift and then you click the button like a physical gift or just like a virtual um it's a virtual gift okay. that you can redeem for a physical product got right it, so it. you can uh translate that into an actual coffee from mm -hmm. you know one of the many coffee vendors like uh Fook long or or uh or highland coffee or you can even like give them a voucher to do mm -hmm. um some shopping in a certain uh retailer so it's different things like that and that's one example where we started off with a small investment and then we started looking at different integrations with our Zalo uh, app mm -hmm. and then you know as we move into other different areas there's also areas where like things like Zalo pay can be integrated to work with uh, certain startups in terms of you know the facilitating transactions and different things like that I mean that sounds like a pretty small company I have no idea what this company is but uh, what in terms of investment size or support, what does that look like? Do you guys have a whole investment portfolio team in terms of manpower? Do you invest tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars? Like what kind of profile or many profiles do you guys kind of put out there? On average, I would say it ranges from, let's say around one to about 10-ish. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite a broad range, right? Like we don't want to get into very early uh, seed type situations mm -hmm. where we're putting in a lot of work helping these guys get off the ground. Right. Uh, more often than not, we're very comfortable dealing with someone that has already done a bit of work and sort of come up with either a prototype or a idea that has been um, launched so far and we can see a little bit of traction. Um, and we're willing to come in um, slightly later, even um, as they need growth capital, mm -hmm. as long as we can see that, hey, th these guys have proven that they can execute and they can actually uh, do what they say they want to do. Got it. And, and on the flip side, so we're talking about VNG investing in the startups. I also understand that you guys have taken in investment. Now, it's not 1 million, it's not 10 million, and I'm not sure how much it is, but it, I'm sure it's hundreds of millions at this point. Um, and I can't recall who they were, I just know they're big institutional sure. players. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit and, you know, uh, going to a listener question again, uh, talking about the investment climate in Vietnam and how people perceive it. So we had a question from uh, a good friend of mine, actually, his name is Stephen Turbin. He used to work at Fulbright University and their innovation center. He's moved on uh, to be doing his own business now. But anyways, we'll let him uh, share his question here with us. Hi, my name is Stephen and I have a question for Kelly. How has the pandemic uh, and the continued rise of foreign investment impacted VNG and the greater Vietnam investment landscape? Yeah, so, well, pandemic, that's obviously a little more uh, within a short window, but um, how do these people perceive the ecosystem and why are they taking the plunge on a company like VNG as opposed to a more public company or sure. some other region? I think if you're investing in a private company um, that you know it, that is technology focused uh, especially like vng mm -hmm. you're taking quite a longer term view of the investment environment or the uh, profile of the company because you understand that a company like ours still has um, quite a bit of runway in terms of where we want to go and what we want to do um, there's certain aspects of our business that you know could require a larger investment that could take longer to mature so different um, verticals of our business are maturing at different rates mm -hmm. so if you're investing in a company like vng you're really betting on uh, the future, mm -hmm. uh, a longer term uh, horizon than normal. Now, the second thing I would say is that overall, the investment environment in Vietnam has been quite positive still. Um, I think if you look at um, over the last three to five years, ignoring the, um, the blip for COVID, 
Um, Vietnam has been a very attractive investment uh, destination for a lot of different types of investors, everywhere from uh, individual investors all mm-hmm. the way up to large institutions. Um, and the geography of where they're coming from ranges significantly, anywhere from North America to Europe um, to even intra-Asian investments into Vietnam. Mm-hmm. One of the things I would say is that Vietnam has had quite a good reputation coming out of the global financial crisis in the sense that it's you know shown that it can grow and expand at quite a responsible and steady rate mm-hmm. and that you know there is a strong underlying consumer and uh, population here that supports a lot of those growth drivers and future consumption of different products and services. Mm-hmm. So I would say that uh, from an overseas investment point of view, that hasn't changed significantly even with COVID. If you compare how Vietnam has handled the COVID situation with other countries around the world, we're still coming out of last year with positive growth, Mm -hmm. right? You know, it's lower than what the country is used to, but it's still significant when you compare it to global peers Mm -hmm. from even other emerging markets to very developed markets. So I would say that Vietnam still is a very uh, attractive investment and uh, locate destination for a lot of investors. And we're still seeing a lot of interest coming from overseas, not just uh, with VNG alone, but with a lot of the different people that I talk to looking to fundraise or looking to find a partner. There's still a lot of attention on Vietnam. That's great. I mean, money aside and investments uh, aside as well, let's talk about people. So, sure. you know, your story uh, coming here 17 ish years ago, mine five years ago. And obviously, there's, uh, uh, there's people living here that are, you know, born and raised in Vietnam and, and emerging into the workforce. There's this emerging kind of trend that I've been seeing where young Vietnamese who have ever had the opportunity to even think about going abroad, they're actually staying here instead. Um, not just for studying, but for working. And the same goes for people that are potentially of overseas Vietnamese um, background, like myself coming here. Um, how has that kind of trend and in terms of people strategy as well impacted VNG? Like uh, the employer brand of VNG, I mean, obviously, unicorn company, highest big growth, Zalo, all that good stuff. Um, are you guys facing challenges? Not, you know, financially, you have a good balance sheet, it seems, but um, to, to achieve this growth, do you have the the people resources in Vietnam to achieve it? Or do you, are, do you guys see yourselves, uh, you know, hiring more foreigners or, or sourcing talent from overseas or even maybe building an office overseas? And, you know, some companies have done that. Uh, what does that look like for, for VNG? I think our people strategy is um, segmented into three different parts, right? Um, you know, talking about supply and demand of talent first, mm-hmm. there is probably a perennial shortage of talent in Vietnam mm-hmm. across different sectors, especially as you get into the more, Uh, specialized areas like, you know, technology or, you know, uh, finance or law and different things like that. So that's an underlying fact. Um, We're facing that challenge um, in the first part by having a very strong outreach program to local universities to make sure that we are, um, you know, talking to and engaging with the top tech talent coming out of university. Mm -hmm. Our offering for them is that we're giving them an opportunity to join a business in one of our verticals straight out of school, get the training, the mentorship and the development that they need and probably wouldn't get in a lot of other places. And hopefully, you know, a good part of that uh, population coming in will develop into strong, uh, you know, uh, junior leaders and then middle managers and also senior leaders. Mm. What we're finding is that um, that has worked very well for us. In terms of numbers, we're seeing a significant um, uh, increases in our ability to attract them. So we're probably intaking, I would say, um, if I'm not mistaken, about a couple hundred people a year just from that uh, alone. The university, new grad. Yeah, kind of across cohort. the country, though, because wow. we've got three offices, one in Hanoi, one in Da Nang, and one in Ho Chi Minh City. Mm. So we're seeing very good traction, but we're seeing thousands of people apply. So we're taking them straight through a process and you know we're taking a, a good solid couple hundred of them a year and mm. um, we're hoping to increase that with broader outreach mm-hmm. the second approach that we're looking at is redeveloping um, internal people for mm-hmm. different roles mm-hmm. so f- a lot of people that have worked with us for a number of years have stayed in very similar roles what we've done is we've done a very uh, specific talent review and we've identified certain people 
that have probably um, you know done the same job for too long mm-hmm. and that might be interested in moving to different verticals. So we're shifting people even within the company to do very different things and really giving them an opportunity to try something new and spending um, the resources and retraining them from a new perspective. So you've got people going from, you know, uh, let's say running a business to uh, going into HR and then moving into a completely different vertical of maybe managing a different part of a business. Mm. So that's sort of the second part of it we're offering. The third one is that we are looking at talent from overseas. Um, You know, the climate has allowed for us to be a little bit more aggressive to look at talent from overseas because while we're looking to expand overseas, a lot of people overseas are, um, their companies are retracting. Mm -hmm. So there's a big opportunity for us to go and engage with uh, potential tech talent that are residing in Asia or even further than that um, to be able to say, hey, you know, there's an opportunity in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. We're trying to take our business outside. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's a match, right? Because you've done it from outside. All you do is come here and learn a little bit about us and how we do things. And maybe we could help each other kind of forge a future in and around the region. Um, Like, for example, I, I think today we've just onboarded um, you know, someone from America, mm-hmm. you know, he's taken on a very senior role, uh, in our technology space. And, you know, he's taken the chance to come over to VNG and also to Vietnam to take on this very senior role. Mm-hmm. So we've seen a lot of instances of those, um, opportunities popping up where we can get really good talent from overseas interested in Vietnam, just because of how well placed Vietnam as a country is, mm-hmm. and also how good, um, you know, the opportunity they feel relative to where they are at um, for, for being in Vietnam. That's great. Yeah, people keep saying Vietnam is the next place in, to be in. Um, of course it is. Um, but if you compare it to China, it's it's a, a fraction of the population size. So how many um, high skilled factory workers are there to make Apple iPhones? I mean, a fraction of China, right? Or Taiwan. And then the same goes for across these different industries, including tech. Sure. So it's great to hear that you guys are keeping things robust, but obviously have challenges, but seem to be solving them. And um, I could definitely sympathize at, uh, at our company as well. Sure. I think moving forward, we're gonna ask a couple more questions sure. here. Um, we wanna really highlight and better understand what are VNG's core strengths. You know, I talked about what's what's the cash machine of the company, mm-hmm. potentially games. You, have, you guys are obviously diversifying beyond that. Yep. Um, what does and this could be a pitch to a, a recruit or someone you're trying to recruit or an investor. Uh, how does VNG approach innovation at its core? Sure. I mean, 16 years in the business, and that's a uh, that's ages. And and um, you've, you guys have launched a ton of products, but um, how do you? What do, like what is the process of product development? How do you decide to launch this AI thing? Is that yeah. just more of a trend chasing thing? I mean, partially maybe, but um, what does innovation look like for you guys in terms of product creation and expanding business lines? Sure. So our view on innovation is that we, as a technology company, must be very focused on not just the product itself, but the process of innovation. So one of our key focuses uh, over the last few years is to, number one, identify good ideas. Um, Number two, you know, envision the application of it, right? Uh, Because making a product with no application is relatively pointless. Mm -hmm. Um, And number three, how do we scale that idea beyond just the uh, initial uh, concept or initial prototyping phase. Um, We've got a good process internally in and around um, people coming to us with ideas. So internally, if someone's got a good idea or just an idea even, we're not afraid to just say, okay, why don't you run with it um, and see where we can end up with it. Some of our really, really um, cool new products that we don't really talk about have come from this process where, you know, someone just came up and said, hey, I want to make this. It's like, okay, well, why don't you just start on it and put a team together and let's see where it goes. And more often than not, as they as the product itself formalizes itself within our organization, we start to move into that. Okay, what's the application of it? Um, and once we've started identify the application with it, then it becomes okay. Then this could actually kick off into a new business. We've got a pull good ideas that we've started down uh, this path already that I've seen in my one year um, go from just prototyping into. Um, okay, looking at a business model and looking to help it scale ready. Mm-hmm. I'll give you a really good example. We've got a great security product called True ID, 
which is really um, my basic, basic non-tech understanding of it is it enables um, our ability to uh, do simple things like EKYC mm. um, for some of our different products and services that we already have. And it was internally developed. They looked at a product um, from overseas and said, you know what, I think we can build our own mm -hmm. and a better one at that. And the team started uh, with a couple of guys just putting it together and now it's become a potential business that we're you know, talking to different merchants and different partners about. Um, another great product that we've launched internally is a simple product called University. Uh, they call it UniPass, mm -hmm. which is really how do we help solve the um, city's problem of getting uh, bus passes, mm -hmm. right, for university students. Simple, simple concept of, you know, how do we issue uh, a card for these people to be able to take a um, bus monthly, you know, like a bus pass. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in its rawest form, it's very simple technology that we've seen in other countries, but it's the whole coordinating with the different people and the stakeholders to be able to implement that, right? We're gonna issue the cards to the students, we gotta work with the schools, and then we've gotta work with the government to make sure that they can use them on the buses. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of these things sort of emerge out of our company where, hey, that's a good idea. Let's start thinking about how we can build it, how we can apply it, and then, you know, how we can roll it out further. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, that's that's innovation at VNG for you guys. Um, Kelly, thank you for joining the show today. Um, super excited to hear about your new adventure at VNG as the VP of Operations. Thank you. Lots of new things happening for you. And and you know when you when I saw you were moving, I had to hear it because I actually don't know too many people at VNG either, especially in a more senior role. So thanks again for joining us at the radio room, guys. Uh, this is your host Hao Tran on another episode of Vietnam Innovators. Again, we've had our guest. Kelly Wong, the VP of operations at VNG, share a bit of insights about the company and, and where they're headed, hopefully the next 16 years. Um, look forward to next week's episode, again, every Tuesday at 11 a.m., released on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and of course, uh, Facebook as well. So thank you again, Kelly. Thank and, you uh, for having me. And we look me. forward to having you next time. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. You can find the full audio of this episode of Vietnam Innovators on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe and tune in every Tuesday morning to listen to other innovating stories of our guest speakers. Thanks for listening to another episode of Vietnam Innovators, brought to you by our partners, health tech startup GeoHealth. They're best known for their doctor at home services, but offer much more than that. If you haven't already, check out their mobile apps on the App Store and Google Play for more or drop by for a visit to their new smart clinic at M Plaza in Ho Chi Minh City.